Hey guys, welcome back to a new doorbell video. First, I want to thank you all for the awesome response on my last video about the doorbell that does it all. It looks like all of you have been waiting for the same doorbell as I have. Well, good news. Even with it now installed, I still love it. In this video, we're going to take a look at how the hardware was installed outside and inside, and how to configure the hardware from scratch, and that includes the outside unit, one of the screens, and the phone app using their P2P service. Now, I know already this is going to be a long video, so I've added jump links down in the description so that you can skip parts or jump to the parts you'd want to watch again when doing this yourself. After this video, I'm planning on doing separate videos on how to integrate the doorbell into Home Assistant and setting up some automations around it. Also, I'm going to look into making a video about running the doorbell in various ways, with and without public internet access. So make sure to stay subscribed for those videos. Right, let's get to installing the hardware. First, we start outside. Here in this shot, you can see my old doorbell still installed, so let me remove that first. I was hoping to reuse the existing hole I made for the previous doorbell, and luckily, with a bit of modification to the network plug, I was actually able to use the same Ethernet cable I already had in that location. The previous install never really progressed much after I installed it, so always looked quite messy. You know how it goes. But that should improve this time around, since it's only a single cable. Right, old doorbell off the wall, and the first thing is to line up the housing box. This is a metal install box, and it perfectly aligns with the doorbell outside unit. You can get two different versions of it, the in-wall or the on-wall version, which is the one I have. The outside unit has a grommet around it, making it tight fit, and it should be weather tight in most situations. They included a cap for the back if you don't use that opening for a cable, but we will be doing so and thus don't need it. Strangely, they don't include a cap for the bottom hole, but maybe that's used for water egress? I'm not sure. Putting the box up against the wall, I'm using my laser level to make sure everything is straight. The included hardware is pretty okay as far as included hardware goes, but I often opt to use my own plugs and screws. Here is a test fit of using those together with the included silicon spacers, and they fit perfectly and make a good seal. So, after aligning the box and doing some hole punching where I need to drill, let's drill some holes. Right, plugs go in, And I had already prepared all screws, so installing this is quite easy, really. Once the install box is securely on the wall, click in the UTP cable to the other part of the outside unit. And since it's only a single cable we need, we can then hook the unit inside of the box with the top first, and then close it up. It fits nicely and snug, and you can secure it down with two screws in the bottom. To power the doorbell, you can either use the PoE switch, which I showed in a previous video, that you can get with the kit, or use your own setup as I'm doing here. This will provide data and power to the outside unit. Although opinions will vary, I think the outside unit looks excellent and doesn't look out of place at the wall at all. I read a lot of comments that it was too big, but maybe in a different spot it would work out better. But for people wanting a different look or spot to install their video doorbell, I've actually worked with the original shop I bought this one from, and they've agreed to send me a different model outside unit, so I can take a look at that one too, and show it to you guys in the video. So, watch out for that video in the future. Next was getting the relay in place to make the chime ring. For this, I pulled back the cable that I ran to the old doorbell spot, since we don't need it there anymore. As I said, we only need a single cable now, and it makes the hole look a lot tidier than it did before. Now that I have the cable back in my wiring closet, 
I hooked up a simple USB phone charger with a USB cable going to an ESP32 development module to which I have connected a cheap relay board which then has the doorbell cables attached to it. Configuration is quite easy using Home Assistant and ESP Home, but as said, that's going to be a video of its own and will be here in the future. Yes, I know this looks janky AF, but I'm planning to tidy this closet up in the future. Yeah, right. It's never going to happen. So this will have to do for now. So let's test it. Okay, so here's the doorbell mounted on the wall. And there is the ringer or chime or whatever you want to call it. And once I press the button, it rings. And well, my phone is here too. And it's saying, hey, somebody pressed the doorbell. And then we can talk to someone. And it'll start beeping and... Okay. So, yeah. 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 Uh oh. No. No. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. That all works perfectly. Awesome. That's working great. Now, all of this is still running with the pre-configuration it came with out of the box. So let's walk through firmware upgrading the devices and then changing the default configuration to suit my network and my own passwords. To start, let's first download the firmware for the outside unit and the screen from the Dahua website. Then we're going to need a tool called the Hua Toolbox. Let's download that too. Once downloaded, unpack both zip files and install the Dahua Toolbox software. Here you need to register for a Dahua account and once that's done, there is a list of software you can install. We need the VDP config tool, so install that one. Once this is done and we start the tool, we see both the units. The outside unit is called VTO and the inside or indoor screen is called VTH. The first step we're going to do is upgrade the firmware with those we just downloaded for both the VTO and the VTH. When trying to upgrade, it will complain that it can't access the units because of the passwords they were set to. You can change the password it uses to access the unit in the search settings dialog up top. Once you do that, you should be able to upgrade each individually with their own set of passwords. There are multiple files to flash, but you should be able to see that on the screen right now. Okay, all done, and both are now running the most current versions as of making this video. Now, for sake of this video, let's make sure to start from scratch. Good, now both devices are uninitialized, so let's initialize them and set the IPs to what we want to use.
little side note, after shooting this part, I decided to change the IP range, but it doesn't really change anything in this guide. Okay, phew, we're getting there, but you have to stay with me a little bit longer. I mean, come on, we'll get this done. Make sure to at least set some decent passwords, especially if you're going to keep them connected to the internet. Once initialized, we can continue configuring from the devices themselves. First, we'll configure the outside VTO unit. We do this by going to the IP address of the device we just set in a web browser. Let's log in with the password we just set and quickly go through the menus. I'll stop and narrate at the important parts. We're not really going to change anything in the main screen. Most of this is regarding the number the outdoor unit has and the indoor unit will have, but defaults are fine for me. I personally do not have an SD card inserted into the outdoor unit since I record everything on the screen and my NVR. So in my case, the event settings down here on the screen don't really matter. Let's move on to video and audio. Let me configure everything the way I like it after having used it for a little while now. One odd thing you might see me do is set the main to 720p and the sub to WVGA. I still don't know why, but the 720p is actually crisper than the 1080p option. So I use it like this for now. I set it to NTSC to be able to get 30 frames per second, and then I enable WDR to make sure everything in the picture is nice and clear without dark spots. Here is the difference of WDR turned off and on. This looks like proper hardware WDR, and it really helps in tough situations with a lot of backlight which is often the case with doorbells. Hmm. I disable all the audio control features. These are the features with which the doorbell will perform uh, actions like when someone presses the doorbell, like making a ringing sound or actually talking to them. But since I don't want it to act like a video intercom, I don't want any of those. And with all these turned off, it'll act like a normal doorbell. In the system menu, I first sync to PC and then enable NTP since I have an NTP server running on my Microtik router. If you don't, syncing to PC should be good enough. And last for this menu, we check if OnViv is enabled for the admin user. Okay, let's move over to the network tab to see if everything is in order there. Here, I change the DNS entry to my router again since that also runs my local DNS server. UPnP is by default, but because we're going to use the P2P feature, we shouldn't need it, so we'll leave it off for now. In the SIP server menu, we do need to configure a few things. All the devices talk to each other using the SIP protocol. By default, the outside unit runs this server. That is fine for our current setup, but we do want to change the SIP server user and SIP server password. Make sure to keep the first user and password listed, default. I'm not entirely sure what those do, but if you change them, I ran into trouble. Also, while configuring, make sure the SIP server is listening to the IP we set manually. If you hit the defaults button, it will enter the default IP, but since we change the IP of the unit, that won't work. And last, make sure it's actually enabled because you can't edit anything with it enabled, but then if you save it without being enabled, uh, you try for a few hours, nothing happens, it all sucks, and yeah, so make sure that tick box is ticked. I don't do anything with the built-in firewall capabilities, I'll arrange that with, well, my own firewall. Next and last for this unit is checking the SIP dialing settings. In VTO number management, you see 8001 listed, which is the VTO outdoor unit itself, as listed in the SIP server. So that's good. Then we have room management. You can see a room as an extension or as a screen, basically. 
In this case, by default, it's configured to have 10 numbers for the same room so that 10 screens can light up at the same time if you want. Keeping in line with the default configuration, we'll keep the number of our room 9901 and more specifically 9901 pound zero so that we know it's trying to call screen zero and well, it can call, it'll call the other ones too, but we're only gonna hook up one screen. We don't need to do anything in VTS management or status. Status I've noticed is empty for a while until everything's been connected and running for a few hours and then you should see some data there. Okay, that's it for the VTO outdoor unit part. Let's move on to the screen. To keep this video kind of manageable in length, let me run through that very quickly. I think most of that was self-explanatory once I showed it. But if not, ask your questions in the comments. Great, now we have a basic setup using some defaults, but at least our own IP range and with our own passwords. And hopefully you understand how some settings are related to each other a bit better now. Let's adjust some other small settings on the screen before we continue. Since it's in my office, I want the screen to light up but it don't need any more sound than the chime makes in the hallway that I hooked up earlier in this video. So here I am disabling that and also changing the video view and screen timeout. I have no clue if keeping the screen on as a video monitor for one hour is going to cause any damage or not, but at least you can set it. Right, we've arrived at the last part and that's configuring the app. Just a few more minutes, come on. I've already used it a few times to talk to package delivery people to tell them where I want them to put my package while I wasn't at home. So for me, up until now, this is working great. For the app, we start by installing GDMSS Plus from the Google Play Store. It should be available for iPhone too, but I don't have one to check. Once that is done, we add the camera. We add the camera by scanning the QR code in the VTO Outdoor Unit network menu. While adding, after scanning the QR code, make sure to give it a device name and use the password you set for the outdoor unit earlier. If all is working correctly, the doorbell should pop up and be visible. Here you can also see options to take a snapshot, record a video, use the open door lock function, or add a two-way audio connection next to the live video. I have noticed that sometimes it doesn't want to establish the two-way audio connection, but I just mash it a few times and I haven't had it take more than five, six seconds to actually get the connection up and running. And remember, we're doing this through their P2P cloud. To enable pop-up alerts when someone presses the doorbell, we go back and then go to the message menu in the bottom bar. There, we hit the plus icon in the top left corner and we get a pop-up that the Hua needs to gather some more data like IP numbers and such to make sure push messages can be delivered. We accept, oh, you know, if you don't have too big of a problem with that, we'll, we'll dive into this deeper in another video and then enable the doorbell we just added. And now, once we press the doorbell, we should get a pop-up on our phone.
<laughs> and that's it. You've done it. You've made it to the end of this video. Quite a lot of stuff covered, maybe not all interesting for your situation, but if you're doing this yourself, make sure to go back to the relevant parts to get all the information. There are easy jump links in the description to do so. I promise the next part in this series will be adding it to Home Assistant and configuring the relay chime. I know a lot of you want to see that part, so don't worry, it's coming. These, these videos take a lot to prepare. If after this video you might want to pick up the video doorbell or any of the other components shown, check out the video description for some affiliate links. And if you do decide to use those, awesome. As always, I hope you enjoyed watching this video or it was at least informative. And I hope to see you back for a next video. Whatever the case, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.